everyone. Good morning. I'm Abby Glassenberg. I'm the co-founder of Craft Industry Alliance. I'm super excited today to welcome you to our keynote speech today with Sarah Trail. Sarah is the founder of the Social Justice Sewing Academy. You may have seen some of the remembrance banners on the show floor that are incredible. So if you haven't seen them yet, go check them out. I'm sure she'll be talking about them. Sarah um, is somebody who inspires me greatly, and I am just so honored to have her here to tell us about this incredible activism project. So Sarah, welcome. Thank you, Abby. Good morning. Um, I'm excited to be here from the Bay Area. Um, I was born in Chicago, so it's it's kind of cool to come back and, and see how how gentrified and how amazing the city <laughs> also has, has always been. Um, I'm here today to share a little bit about SGSA um, and the new projects that we have started since COVID hit. A um, little bit about me. Um, I'm 27. I'm almost 28 next year. Um, and I went to UC Berkeley and Harvard. Um, and I'm an only child of two college-educated parents, which I think is really important to give context on how I grew up. The positionality of what socioeconomic privileges I have are really important when you think about the context of how I was raised and particularly having two parents who poured absolutely everything into me. Um, and a quote that's been, I think, one of the foundational quotes for starting SGSA is there's really no such thing as the voiceless. There are only the deliberately silenced or the preferably unheard. I think that quote really hit hard when I heard it from Aaron Dottie Roy because I was working at a high school in Berkeley and a lot of the kids were sharing the lack of agency and autonomy they had, not only in their school systems, but often you know, at home or living with grandparents or like, like for example, a specific problem in that school was like they were getting tracked to the AHA, which is the Arts and Humanities program or the Science and STEM program. And unless you had a lot more parent support and buying a lot of science related stuff, they couldn't even be in the science school. So they were like, we can't even take certain classes because we're not in that academy. And so the way that that school is tracking kids from freshman to senior year, it was hard to switch. And they were just, you know, they weren't saying the words agency and autonomy, but really they were just frustrated because they weren't feeling heard. They're like, we're in school, we're spending all our time here and no one's really listening to us. And I'm like, you know, being a 14, 15 year old freshman, you know, it's hard to get adults to listen to you. But I think when I think back of like how I engaged with my parents and being an only child, my parents always listened to me. So I think it was really different to, to be around kids that felt voiceless when in my relationship of, you know, how I was raised and growing up in church, you know, I, I felt like I did have a voice. So kind of learning that um, um, was, was kind of eye opening. And when we started SGSA and brought it to that school, you know, a lot of the kids had never really had the opportunity to sew. And so the purpose of sewing to like have your voice heard, you know, really resonated with them. A little bit about me. Um, this quote was made by my great great grandmother. Her name was Margaret Smart, and she was born a slave. Um, and she was like basically born a slave because she was born in Ethiopia, but she was brought over here, like it's transatlantic slave trade um, in the early 1800s. And she, not only did she make this quilt, but she was raped by her owner, um, who she bore four kids by. And um, my great grandma had the quilt and like my grandma eventually got it. And then when I started sewing at 12, she gave it to my mom. So not only do I physically have this quilt, but I remember being a 12 year old, like, man, this quilt is ugly. Like um, <laughs> the binding wasn't to code. You know, and, and I think, you know, it, it's a little crooked. You can see clothes that were made in it. And really, when you look at the quilt, you can see literal burrs of cotton that have like brown, like, like brown burrs in it. And so it was just like, they didn't even use the right batting. And I was like, Sarah, like this, you know, she doesn't have the amenities of going to a locally owned quilt shop. Like this isn't, so I think when I was younger, I was kind of like, Ugh, I don't want to say that this is where I come from. But I think now I have a far more respect for it. And um, even though I'm like the product of slavery, rape, and pedophilia, the intersection of all three, I think that I come from a, I represent generations of talent and resilience in the face of racism, discrimination, and injustice. Um, and so that's a, a photo. She's the woman in the chair and everyone else's you know, great grandparents that I never met. But um, going back, so I started sewing when I was four. Um, my mom put me in sewing classes. She put me in pottery classes. She put me in horseback riding classes. She put me in beading classes. So I was in all the classes, but I think sewing really stuck because I didn't have to go somewhere else to do it. I could do it at home. And um, being an only child, if I could do something at home, she'd go all in for it. So if I wanted to make anything, Sarah, let's go. Let's go to the store, let's get it. You know, leave me alone. Um, but I think as I got older, um, 
I, I really just, I, I like learning new skills. I like taking classes to learn applique, then taking a new class to learn paper piecing, then taking a new class to learn a double wedding ring quilt. And I think because sewing had so many options and so many classes, I was always challenged. So it wasn't the same as doing the same mundane thing over and over, but it was like every time I took a new class, I'd want to go home, finish the class quilt, make one more to be a little bit better at it, and then I want a new class. I don't want to make the same style quilt twice. Um, but by the time I was, um, you know, older, I did a lot of, you know, I went through like a, that conservative fabric period where it's like everyone was into like that slave quilt fabric. And I was like, oh, I wanna make Underground Railroad quilt. And again, I was only making patterns, but I just had fun learning. I don't like hand applique. Um, I only like machine. I definitely like speed, but I do enjoy paper piecing. I made my first double wedding ring quilt in eighth grade. So I think really understanding, um, you know, how, how many quilts I took was really because my parents had the, the privilege to afford these classes and, and all the money and custom long arm quilting that, you know, obviously came with it. Um, so then after a while of quilting, I was like, you know, I'm tired of quilting. I want to sew clothes. So then my mom's like, all right. So she paid for a private fashion designer to teach me how to drape and draft patterns. So the time I was in 10th grade, um, I got offered to be on Project Runway. My mom said, no, we weren't missing school. But more than that, I could really see any dress and design and draft that pattern. And so then that was a different level of confidence. I kind of moved away from quilts and more like, okay, I'm in high school now. I want to, you know, sew clothes. And so this is a quilt I made, in, or this is a dress I made in ninth grade. I went to private school. They believed that dancing led to pregnancy. So we never got to dance at prom, homecoming, or anything. We would have three course meals on cruises, private Christian school. Really problematic, but we're not even going to go into that. Um, <laughs> But, but really, you know, we got dressed to bring a date to sit there. I mean, there wasn't even hand-holding, and that was okay with me because that was fine. But really, um, it was just fun to, to make clothes and show up in stuff that you had made. And I think being in private school, lots of people had stuff that had been made for them, but I was one that made their own. And I made my dates matching, so we kind of won best dressed. But um, moving forward, by the time I was in, like, ninth grade, I got offered a book deal with C&T. And so I wrote a how to sew book for teens and tweens, and it wasn't to sew clothes, it wasn't to sew quilts, it was just to sew fun stuff. Because being a young sewing kid, I could make backpacks, tote bags, tea, you know, pillows, I could make anything, and I could do like, what I would do would be like sewing birthday parties. Again, talking about my middle, back, middle class background, a mom would pay me to come for her kid's house with four sewing machines, and like all 30 kids would make PJ pants. So I'd have all these pre-cut kits, instead of paying for like pump it up, like my sewing class would be the fun part of the birthday party, or if it was boys, I'd come in with these pre-cut apron kits I'd make. The boys would do basically like sew the top, sew the sides, and then paint the apron. So like the craft creativity was the birthday party. So I was like, you know, a ninth, 10th grader making lots of money doing these middle class privileged birthday parties, but I was having fun and kids got to sew. So it was a win-win. Um, I think I really enjoyed sewing and I wanted more young people to get into sewing. Um, but I think as I went on, um, I did the book and then after that, c &T had me do a DVD, which is different projects. After that, I got the opportunity to design a fabric collection. So then I designed a fabric collection, actually two, and they each have like 12 fabrics that are all like, you know, $12 a yard, quilting fabrics. Um, and then after that, I flew to New York and I designed a collection of patterns with simplicity, all before junior year of high school. So when I'm out in New York, you know, they're like, well, let's make sure you can actually sew. They had a studio that was like to the, to the gods. And I was like, I really like this. Soon after I designed the Simplicity Pattern Collection, I got the Project Runway deal, but it was a lot of missing school and going to LA. And my mom literally said no. And I was like, what the heck? And she's like, I, we're, not, we're not doing that. She's like, you were here to focus on school and go to college. And if you want to be a fashion designer, good luck, because we wouldn't be paying for that degree. So I was like, wow, all right. Um, you know, that, that immigrant mindset is real. Um, she was like, you can, you know, and, and of course, my parents encouraged this, anything I wanted to do, but they're like, you can do this on the side. This cannot be, I was definitely bound by lots of rules from my parents. Um, but, you know, it was okay with me. I think something that shifted my personal trajectory and how I viewed and interacted with the sewing world was February 26, 2012. Um, on this day, Trayvon got murdered. And I think that really was a wake up call for me. Um, not because I knew him, obviously, but I think it was just the way of like, like this kid got killed and I think the lack of, like the weekend after he got killed, um, I was in a sewing class and we were working on these kaleidoscope stars that took eight half square triangles to even piece the stars together. So they were like, one class made one star. Like it was a really tedious class. But I was in the class and these weren't strangers. These were, you know, quilters that I had, you know, taken roughly a few classes with, but I didn't know them like friends, friends, but like we weren't strangers. And I remember going to that class and like, guys, Trayvon got killed this weekend. Like, what are we gonna do? Like. Like, I'm just, I'm still kind of pissed. My parents were talking about it. My school wasn't, but that's because I went to private, you know, Christian school. They didn't engage anything sociopolitically, unfortunately. But in that quilting space, I remember bringing it up, and so many of the quilters were like, did you know him? Like, it was in Danville. 
to give context for those who are from California. It was a quilt class in Danville. Um, and they were just like, okay, anyways, back to sewing. And I remember feeling like that quote, like deliberately silenced or preferably unheard. And it's not that I wanted them to clearly bring his life back because they couldn't, you know, he's already, but like do something. Like, why don't we make a quilt? Why don't we say something as a statement? Why don't we as quilters do something because this kid just got killed? And I remember like going back to my mom, I was like, mom, they didn't care. And she's like, Sarah, these are retired millionaires. Like not everyone's gonna have the same interests as you. And I think that was really a wake up call of like, dang, like I spend so much of my time with a community that doesn't care about anything that I care about. So when I went back home, I was like, she was like, well, Sarah, if, you know, make a quilt about it. If you want to bring it to the quilting world, make a quilt about it. And I'm like, make an art quilt. So I went out, I bought a sacro book. I started looking at art quilters because, you know, that's a little a traditional. And I was grown up very much follow the rules, follow the quarter inch seam, pick it out if it's not right. Rigidity, you know, the norms of sewing, like I followed that. And so to make a quilt without a pattern, I was like, hmm, this is different. Draping is different because I'm looking at something and I'm making it. But making an art quilt without a pattern, I definitely bought a Sacco Master quilt book and I looked at it and I was like, all right, I'm ready now. Went to the store, clearly parents paid for everything, bought all this fabric, and then I made this quilt. And it was a big quilt. And I brought it to get long-armed and my traditional long-armer said she didn't want to do it. And I was like, all right, I'll do it myself. So if you look at the back of this quilt, it looks like a you know 16-year-old quilted it because they did. Um, and my throat on my machine was not meant for quilting. So it's really bunched up on the back. Don't ever look at the back. But it really wasn't about the quilting. It was about, I made this quilt. Now I can enter it in the quilt world and have some of these conversations that I want to do. And coming from a kid, I'd make an apron or a prom dress and quilt stores would put it in their windows. Brightex. I could make tote bags and Brightex would be like, all right, Sarah, we sell your book. We'll put the tote bags in the window. I went to the same places that had always featured my work. And like, they knew me, like literally, they'd known me since I've been 12. And I said, hey, you know, I made this new quilt. And they said, oh yeah, let's see it and everyone said no. They wouldn't show the quilt in their quilt store. So I was like, all right, maybe they're not selling these boutiques. Let's try something else. I entered it in the local quilt shows, and they would accept all the flying geese, all the paper piece, all the nine patch pizzazzes, all the most irrelevant pattern quilts I made, and they denied this quilt and accepted everything else. In minors and quilt shows, your quilts don't get rejected. Like, it was, like, it was really eye-opening to see how rejected I was from an industry that I had put almost my entire childhood into and to make a quilt that I really cared about and have everybody be like, yeah, no, we're not gonna show that quilt. It was just like, damn, I was really used. And my mom was like, so find a different space. So I was like, all right, um, that was, you know, I ended out a lot of my contracts. I ended out, Joanne's had me literally flying across the country to Joanne's, teaching kids how to sew. Lots of kids would come and I, you know, like they'd only be middle-class kids though that could afford a $75 sewing class. So I think a lot of my teaching and my love for teaching sewing was really hit at the intersection of I was only teaching privileged kids how to sew. And if they came to my class with the rotary cutter machine, this $30 pattern, all these other accoutrements needed to take this class, they really didn't need me to be there in the first place. They had enough access outside. So that was kind of an eye-opening moment. Um, and I went to UC Berkeley. I started making more quilts because I wanted to share the message, not because I wanted people to copy the quilt. Like I wasn't making quilts for patterns anymore. Um, and at Berkeley, you know, BSU, you know, just Berkeley in general, Berkeley libraries would be like, we can show that quilt, you know, because Berkeley has a very, you know, amazing culture. Um, this quilt was inspired by Sean Kimber, reverse applique, hated the entire process. I hate hand sewing. Um, but it was interesting to learn, you know, how you know, cutting the background. Again, just all about technique. Um, and so that was really kind of the inspiration for what led to starting at UC Berkeley. SGSA kind of started at UC Berkeley. They gave me a seed grant to teach kids how to sew for a six week summer program. And I think it was so interesting because in all the contracts I'd ever had, you know, teaching about like how to sew and who I wanted to bring into sewing, people would be like, communities of color, they don't let their kids sew, like they're not necessarily interested. And I'd be like, well, why don't we have some stuff be free? Like, you know, if Joanne's would make this prom dress class free for Saturday, I'm sure they're like, yeah, we're here to sell, like capitalism, you know, blah, blah, blah. And it was just interesting to be like, always told that kids of color didn't want to sew. And so then to make SGSA be a free summer program, we had over 70 kids who applied to be in the summer program. And most of them were low income kids from Berkeley, Richmond, Oakland. So it was like, dang, everyone's been lying. They just can't afford to sew. So that was really kind of affirming some of the ideas that I had, but I hadn't seen. So it's like, I can't say that kids of color want to sew if I've never seen it. And if you Google like kids of color, or if you Google kids sewing, you'll never see ourselves, you know? So it's kind of like perpetuating the notions of who gets access to sewing, who can afford sewing, you know, who gets, you know, to be in those spaces, who has grandparents who have sewing studios. In California, real estate is a scarcity and having a sewing studio is really saying something. Um, but as you say, it was really fun. All of our kids, 
Um, I wanted them to have the full quilt experience, so we brought them into a store. I called the store owner beforehand, like, hey, I'm gonna bring a bunch of kids who've never been into your store, and it was so fun. The kids had a blast, the staff was great, and the customers, not so much. They were definitely looking like, what are these kids doing? Why are they running around, touching everything? And I was just like, mm, I don't know, like, don't worry about them. But the staff was amazing, um, you know, a local Berkeley shop. And really, the grant allowed them not only the autonomy to design their own quilts, but the autonomy to buy their own fabrics. And so each kid making, you know, $100, $200 worth of a fabric purchase for their own quilt, they were like, Fab this cloth is so expensive. And I'm like, guys, be quiet. We're gonna work on the rhetoric later. Um, but it was really the whole, like from start to gamut, they designed and they didn't, you know, they designed their own mini quilt. And so we really started, I started SGSA with the unlearning. I started SGSA with, we're not doing quarter inch seams. We're not doing this like any sewing class I've ever taught. We're not gonna focus on how to thread the machine and thread care. We're gonna focus on the art. We're gonna focus on what do you wanna say? Then we're gonna use sewing as the medium to do that. It was very much like unlearning all the, the rigidity and the norms and the structure of what sewing classes are typically like. And so in creating the space, you know, sewing was just the medium. It was literally used as an art form. A lot of the boys were like, sewing's for girls. This is for grandmas. And I was like, let's, let's deco like, where did you learn that? Who said that? Well, well, Google. And I'm like, yeah, well, Google also says if you Google beautiful woman, you're not going to be there. Do you believe that? So let's unpack this and say that we're going to be not only artists, but we're going to be artivists. And we're going to be, you know, artist, activist, hybrid. And we're going to be using sewing as our medium to become artivists. So after that, the kids all like change their, like, we're not doing sewing because we're making quilts. We're artivists, and we're making these quilts so we can talk about these issues in our communities. So all the kids were juiced. He was on ankle monitor the whole program, and his probation officer would show up. And he's like, I really like this hand sewing. I'm stabbing it. And I'm like, all right, Juan, you know, whatever you want. But they would, they would be in there, you know, pants, sagging, cussing, really just a space that a quilt shop could have never really traditionally held. And so in having that space, it was not only freeing, but to see all these boys sewing, but it's not even about the boys sewing, everyone, like they, we'd, we'd add playlists and everyone could add to it. And like whatever space we wanted, we cultivated. It was a very a traditional, you know, sewing space. Um, and so after that, all those kids made mini art quilts. They're beautiful, but for the sake of time, we're gonna move forward. Um, so then after that, I went to Harvard. I went and got my master's in Harvard. Um, I skipped two grades, um, like third and like sixth grade. So I started Harvard at 20 and I wasn't 21 yet. And Harvard has a big culture of like drinking and like going out with peers. So not only am I 20 in grad school, but I'm 20 in grad school with my cohort members that are like ex principals and like, like they're just a lot older than me. And I'm like, hey, like let's do stuff. And they're like, yeah, you're 12. You got here because you passed the GRE well. You're not really welcomed. So that was a whole different, you know, double consciousness on itself. So really when I got to Harvard and I was socially feeling kind of isolated, um, and my mom didn't want to visit me because it was cold. I reached out to a lot of high schools and I was like, hey, my name is Sarah. I've done a lot of sewing stuff. I led this really cool activist summer program last summer. Would you mind if I bring a workshop to your space where we're going to talk about like critical race theory and we're going to talk about like race equity, oppression, structure, like, and then every kid is going to make a block. And after they each make their block, I'll sew the whole quilt together and I'll make a quilt. So teachers are like a free lesson plan by all means. So all these schools um, in Dorchester and stuff would be like, yeah, come in, come. And I, so I was like, okay, mom, I need some money. I'm gonna do sewing. And she's like, where? And I'm like, don't worry about it. Like, can you please Apple pay me? Cause I'm broke. Um, and again, my parents came through. They sent me a lot of money. I went out there um, and bought all this fabric and batiks and stuff. And then I went into this class and I had never really done a make a block workshop because my only experience had been making a full art quilt. But I'm like, if every kid makes a block, we're gonna start with drawing. Um, and then after we draw, they're gonna come up with their design. Um, this is a really young, young cohort. I, I did a lot of all ages. If anyone wanted it, I emailed like 50 schools and like 30 of them said yeah. So I was really like, I shouldn't have emailed elementary, but that was a later thought. Um, but yeah, so these kids were drawing, and I think it was really interesting because often when we think of elementary school students, we don't think how affected they are from gangs and gun violence. And just because they're not having the rhetoric to really talk about these issues that are in their community, they see it and they know like, my cousin has been killed by guns. Like they can't say, you know, the systemic, you know, factors that have contributed to that, but like they're five, six, seven years old and they know it. Um, scissors got hard to use, so after a long few workshops with all these kids, I definitely was like, y'all can just color. You know, I got tired. Um, but then as we went back to high school, I think the art became a little more personally, you know, impacted and their artist statements became better. Um, so like, you know, older kids would clearly make art that reflected, you know, issues that they cared about. Um, younger kids too. These are examples of just kind of what some of the workshops looked like. Um, it would be a lot of kids at once. It would be, you know, 10 kids, 12 kids, a full class. One school's like, we're going to do an all-school retreat. And I'm like, what are you talking about? And she's like, all 312 kids are going to be there. And I'm like, what? And it was 
it was a lot. And so we did like these big cohorts and like, you know, over 50 to 100 kids at once would be making blocks. And it's like, at the end of the day, it's not an art project, it's a what moves your heart project. So really you don't need to worry about being a good artist. And so after you get there, like levels like, I'm not a good artist, I've been told I can't draw. It's like, yo, the fabric is beautiful regardless. So regardless of if you can draw or not, you're cutting out shapes, this is collaging. But then what happened is um, I got all these blocks and I couldn't just sew them into the quilt because some of the glue was coming up. So then I realized we needed embroidery. And I remember I hate hand sewing. So I went to Instagram and I remember posting and asking like quilt guilds, like, hey, I have all these amazing blocks that these kids have made cut and glued. Would your guild mind hand embroidering all these blocks and shipping them back to me? And then, you know, the guilds, white savior mentality, oh, kids of color made these, we'll do it. I was like, whatever, y'all, you know, let's go for it. So I shipped these guilds that really had no intention in social justice or any anti-racism or really any equity work at all. But the idea of, you know, volunteering with kids of color, you know, they saw the photos and they would say, sure. And I just needed the labor. So it was a win-win. Um, they'd embroider the blocks and ship them back, and we'd make these really beautiful community quilts. And by we, like that's the amount of blocks that would come out of one session. And so there are a lot of blocks that need a lot of hand sewing, and more than hand sewing. Sometimes the kids would be like, can you add words? Because lots of kids can't cut out letters of fabric well, because it's hard, and, or their letter would be too big. And they're like, yeah, I need this to be small. I'm like, we can ask the embroidery person. So not only would they make the blocks, but they'd write a detailed artist statement. This is my name, this is my block, this is why it matters, this is what it means to me. And then they'd be like, in thread, can you add add hair on this person, add a tear, add fire, add flowers. I want this to look like gentrified side and I want this to look like a ghetto. Can you make this side look pretty and make this side look ugly? So the embroidery volunteers would do a lot more than just sew everything down and secure it, but they really embellish, enhance, and most importantly, listen to these kids' voices. And I think that was really an empowering part of the process, the fact that these kids knew that these blocks were going to a volunteer that might be retired, probably is middle class or above, and is out of state. They're like, my block is traveling? I'm like, yeah, this is going to a guild in Hawaii, y'all. Like, you know, wherever it is, the fact that like someone mattered about their art and it became this intergenerational collaboration really made the kids get excited. Um, and so then all the blocks would come back and I would spend a lot of time. Um, so workshop, I come in, you know, and it's like a four hour workshop, easy four hours. Sometimes a, a school would give me two days. So like day one would be talk and design. Day two would be making the block. Um, and then I mail it to an embroidery volunteer who gets the raw block, gets the raw artist statement, embroiders it all spends a lot of time, then they ship them back to me, we lay all the blocks out, um, and by we, I mean like it was me for like two years, and then I expanded into asking guilds to sew it, and now we have an amazing place in Vacaville um, called Cloth Carousel that allows us to just sew it, and all these women come together, and it's really sewn as a community now, and if you look at the difference between um, like our quilts that I made by myself, like in my, my house versus, you know, the people, like when we have a whole guild making it, the intricacy of what we can make now versus one person is night and day. Um, Nancy's, for the most part, embroidered or long arm quilted almost all of our quilts as a volunteer. And then lastly, but not leastly, we get the quilt scene. So I think an important piece of why SJSA and why kids get so invested in this process is they know that they're making this art to be seen by people and, and to be like read and have their artist statements read and have these quilts be seen in other venues. I think often something that UC Berkeley taught me is it's not that fun to write a paper for a professor, have the professor grade it, you get a grade and then that's it. UC Berkeley had classes that were AC, American Cultures, which is really teaching about engaged scholarship where instead of writing an article for a professor or a paper for a professor, they'd be like, make a Wikipedia page, go make a Medium article, go make scholarship that can be digestible by communities because there's no point in doing this learning if it's just in a, in a chasm between you and me. And so the fact that these kids were making these quilts or making these pieces or making these blocks, knowing it's not gonna lay on someone's bed, but it's gonna be in a museum, in a library, in a show, they were making it for the purpose of public consumption and really public education. And so I think the fact that like that empowering alone was like, you know, really had them buy into, they wanted to make art. So these are examples. This is, you know, how many blocks. We have all these blocks that'll come back from one workshop. Each quilt can only show 20 blocks, but that's okay. That just means we have to make more quilts. Um, all blocks get put into quilts. Um, it just depends on how soon we get it back from the embroidery, et cetera, et cetera. Right now we have still over like 200 blocks, but like a workshop will be 100 plus blocks and it takes us weeks to finish one quilt. So it's a, you know, a slow-ish process, but we, we make it happen. But these are the examples of quilts that we make with the community. So when you look at these, these two quilts, 20 kids made each block, so one kid per block, um, 20 adults embroidered each block. And just to uh, like enunciate an example of the collaboration, that Be More block on the third row in this blue quilt, 
Um, you can't see it, but in the words be more, the kid asks in the embroidery instructions, I want you to add all these zip codes of the white affluent areas in the words. So there's all these zip codes in be more. And then I want you to embroider a red line around be more. And then in all the gray buildings, I want you to add the zip codes of me and my friends and where we're from. So as you look at that block and you see all those numbers, you're like, what is this? But you have to know the context and read their artist statement to realize that entire block is about redlining, gentrification, and access and equity between you know, neighborhoods and what has public education and what doesn't. Um, Racial profiling, you know, that block has words. That, that block next to racial profiling is like racism, laws are cutting, and in the balloon it says dream. And it just shows that like the, really the collaboration between both of them is really important. Um, solidarity exists at the core of the SGSA textile artwork, community art workshops, youth leadership, um, and it's a really like a 21st century sewing circle. Um, In-person workshops prior to COVID, you know, kids would we'd do it all in person, and when COVID hit, you know, we obviously moved to Zoom. Um, but really, this is just an example of not only the community's time, but really community's hours. Like when you look at these quilts, this is hundreds of hours that people have participated. And now we don't mail blocks just to guilds, we mail blocks to individuals. So like the blocks will go to Minnesota, Idaho, California, Nebraska, like anyone can sign up to embroider a block from regardless of where they live. And so um, it's really like a nationwide, you know, kind of textile art project. Um, but I think that's important. Over time, after receiving a lot of notes from the embroidery volunteers who've done this um, and learned about youth's visions for a better future, issues they have in their communities, it's become clear that often the embroidery volunteers are getting to participate in the learning process almost just as much as the kids. Because I think it's really interesting when you do a workshop in like Chicago and they're talking about these issues and the blocks travel to you know Danville where they're not having the same issues that kids in Chicago are having. And you read these kids' artist statements and then you look into the issue because you want to you know obviously know what you're embroidering about so you can like maybe add a quote or a statistic or you know enhance the block. I often will find like I didn't know this existed like this isn't you know like it was just a really eye-opening experience so I think often you know it's 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 bridging a network between two communities that might often not really walk the same walks of life nor have you know friendships I know sometimes the kids will be like can you give me the embroidery name of who's gonna do my block and like kids will follow the embroidery artist and I'll be like go for it and then people will be like is this my kit yes and they're like like you know it, it's been it's been really like fun I think to kind of just to be like the medium between this gap but I think um, Often kids will share things such as sexual assault, trauma. There's been definitely a sort of justice side as well as mandated reporter side of like when some things are shared, you know, other people, you know, we, we definitely have had to, you know, like you're saying your uncle is sexually abusing you. Like let's not only make the block, but then afterwards we need to talk and we need to also let an adult that's, that's here, you know, like, but I think that art is so therapeutic. Um, and so giving, you know, young people an outlet to, you know, make textile art, not only do they get in with the, the vision, the project, and I think the hope of the outcome of like why we make this art, but really just that expression, you know, um, to be able to make not only a safe space, but a brave space. Um, this is just an example, because I have like every kid's artist statement. If I, if I remember reading it, I can share it. Becca was a foster kid from Oakland who has a non-binary older sibling um, that her foster parents did not adopt, nor did they really engage with because they painted their nails and all that kind of stuff. And black community like, is not necessarily on board with non-binary you know, queer young people um, due to religious homophobia and lots of other internalized stuff stemming from slavery. But nevertheless, um, Becca's whole block was about like beyond the binary. And what was interesting, I think, and important, one, you can see she has a bigger block than everyone. She asked for that. Everyone typically gets a 15 inch block. I tell them, you know, fill up the block. Don't make it too small. Don't let it go over the edge. Teach them about seam allowance. And Becca was like, yeah, I have a really big idea. I need a bigger block. And I was like, all right. So I always bring fabric. Girl, tell me what you need with your 12 year old self. So I give her a bigger block and she's like, okay. And the one rule I always say is this is your block. It's a Kona cotton thing. This is an expensive bolt of fabric. Like don't cut your block, cut your fabric and glue it onto your block. And I tell that to all kids because sometimes they'll cut a heart or something out of their block background and then be like, I'm ready to glue. And I'm like, you cut your block background. Like, you y'all pay attention and within five minutes of starting this she had cut a big hole in the block that she just asked for a bigger block and I said Becca and she's like yes yeah, Sarah it's part of my design idea I need this like this and I'm like I don't know what you're about to do but girl you better not ask for another block because you're gonna get a 15 inch one and soon after she put a fabric behind it and she couldn't cut her words small enough because this wasn't her design she wanted beyond and then the binary but her letters were too big but I was like that's not gonna be as powerful impactful if you get embroidered so cut out your letters you know I'm not gonna help you you know how to do this she sat there for like two hours cutting out all those letters and really you know she made those silhouettes and her instructions for the embroidery volunteer was embroider my female silhouette in blue and embroider my male silhouette in pink and then her whole artist statement was about 
Adults need to be more accepting. Being non-binary doesn't mean you need to be judged. If someone wants to paint their fingernails, let them. Like very 12 year old, not really understanding the rhetoric and associations between, but it wasn't about that. It was about her experience. She loved her brother. Her parents didn't. He wasn't in a great foster home. You know, it was just empathy. And I think what's really powerful is not only did the embroidery volunteer embroider the people and the color she asked, but they embroidered a whole suit and tie over the female, embroidered a whole dress over the male silhouette even playing on like, you know, and she didn't ask for that, but she asked for the colors. The embroidery volunteer, like, that's the example of the agency that the embroidery volunteer has in this collaboration. So that was an example. Becca then sees her block, because we posted on Facebook, and everyone gets seen a follow. And she's like, I love my block. Can you make sure it's in the center? I was like, yes, Becca. <laughs> Whatever you need, girl. So she got that. But I mean, as you can see, just an example of like one quilt. Equal education made by a young girl whose parents were from Iran. Her mom didn't get to go to school. Amazing artist statement. Um, Immigration, the second block, it has chain link fence seen over it. One world, many people, LGBT love, healthcare is too expensive, LGBT love, we have the right to be heard. This block down here is really important and a girl made it and she's like, Sarah, I'm not an artist, I'm not good at this. And then she found this fabric that had letters and was like, I want my whole block to be words. And I was like, okay, cop out, but that's fine. This is an art project, do whatever you want. And her quote said, the people who hid Anne Frank were breaking the rules. The people that killed her were following them. And her whole artist statement was about, just because it's a rule doesn't mean we need to follow it. Just because it's a law doesn't mean we need to follow it. Sometimes we have to be like that one guy and do good trouble. And I was like, you need to go quote him. We're not going to publish this artist statement unless you quote, you know. But like, really, it was just, it was about like, like, that's such a real quote. And to come from a middle schooler who knows, like, not all laws need to be followed. Like, that's just showing the power of not only Gen Z, but the power of the young people we're raising. The power of, you know, not just following things blindly. The power of deciding, am I, does this align with me? Is this, you know? And so I think, you know, her block was amazing. Ma, I can't take it anymore. Those are the words of Khalif Browder in his suicide note from Rikers. Um, vote. And then at the bottom it says, remove stubborn orange stains. We had Trump during this time. Um, <laughs> Down there, it's gun violence, and it, like, you can't really see, and people are like, what's that brown blob and that gray blob? I'm like, that was a gun and a person. You know, be grateful. These are like 12-year-olds. Like, be gracious. This is not an art critique project. Um, immigration, you know, everyone is an immigrant, talking about uh, America's original land, um, never again, abortion. Um, and so as you can just look at one quilt, like, we have like dozens and dozens of quilts reflecting dozens and dozens of ideas. And um, as you, you know, get to like read all these artist statements, they're really like, I mean, yeah, they're written from young people, but they're really impactful to see like what they care about, what they feel needs to change, and kind of like reflections on this world that adults have created for them. Um, this is an example of Brian. Brian's a young guy who um, from Oakland, and he's like, Sarah, like he was one of those, I don't want to be a quilter. And then after he made his quilt and got to speak at a quilt show, he's like, oh, I have another idea. I want to make another one. So this is Brian's second quilt. Um, and his quilt is on like true American history. And he liked this book after he read a lot of excerpts from that book, Lies My Teacher Told Us. So that was a book that we you know, brought into the curriculum, we read lots of chapters, and they're like, why don't we have these books? And I'm like, Yo, the American school system, like that's a different ball game. But this is the quilt he made. And you can't see it that well, because these are all iPhone photos. But this quilt has embroidered nooses. He painted blood-stained dripping. And I mean, like he, this quilt is, like this detail shot is probably the best you have. But like embroidering outlines of people shooting and getting shot, like those are the stars of what makes up America's flag. The blood dripping, the lynching. And you can see that like it's all a bunch of silhouettes. And then like in the second row, like kind of high, is like this black silhouette or brown silhouette with a graduation hat that doesn't have a in it, that's him. And that's his positionality in this quilt. And that's how he feels like he's, you know, rising above his ancestors and being something that his family not as a first generation college student. And I mean, his artist statement is just powerful. And this quilt is called Red, Blood, White, and Blue. And he made it as an 18 year old. And clearly, you know, he got help on the embroidery and clearly someone long armed it. But the design elements alone, like, Kids are really talented, and I think often, you know, we, we look at kids like, yeah, they're not good quilters because, like, you know, you got to be 30 years plus to be a master art quilter. And it's like, yo, if we could just decolonize some of the rules and norms in this quilting industry, like, we have so many future Bisa Butlers that are out there. They just don't have parents like Bisa has. Bisa has parents very similar to mine. Her dad was a college professor. Like, they supported and believed in that. They let her get a degree in art. That's more than mine would have done. But, like, you know, like, it, it's powerful to have encouragement and it's powerful to have the financial support to explore that encouragement um, and so when people donate and sponsor and support us just say we buy kids fabric and we uber them to things and we bring them food and all that kind of stuff um, this is another example Yo, she could easily be the next Bisa Butler let's put her in parent you know in classes and let's get her in training like Audrey was 17 when she made this quilt called American Scream a rhetorical play on the American dream talking about kids in cages 
Um, and so like, like literally like her color composition to make an entire kid out of just shadows like, kids have so much raw talent. They just don't have, you know, mentors, and they don't have money, and they don't have, you know, like, it, sewing's expensive. These, these quilts are expensive. Like, we're, we're paying for it, but, like, most kids don't have someone getting ready to spend $200 on their first quilt project. But them having that encouragement of, like, wow, someone spent 200 on my first quilt project gives them the encouragement on my, on my next, they're going to be ready. We're not, just we're not giving them scraps. And for workshops, we do. All things are donated. That's a different story. But when kids make quilts, we let them have that experience of going to a fabric store and seeing what this world is. And really, you know, before you make and commit to making a full quilt, a mini quilt, because these quilts are maybe, like, three feet by five feet, um, you know, like you, you get to pick what you want. It's the agency and autonomy to have the full quilting experience. Because some people, for some people, buying the fabric is the most fun part. Fi buying the fabric and then after it gets long armed, you know. Um, this is an example. When we do workshops, this is what they look like. There's definitely music playing. But more than that, when kids go through our workshop and they're like, oh, you know, I had fun in this workshop. I want to lead my own workshop. It's like, all right, we've got a training. We will train these high schoolers to be able to give the workshop. And then when someone's like, hey, I'm in a school in Nebraska. Can you come out and do it? We'll ask our high school that just been recently trained facilitators if the teacher's female and we can let them sleep at the teacher's house. We have a high schooler that can come do this. Can you give them a $500 stipend? So a big part of SGSA is really promoting youth leadership because at the end of the day, it's not an art class. So you don't need to be that trained. You need to know the framework. You need to know the questions. You need to know how to start the conversation because really everyone's gonna make what they wanna make. You just have to say, what's the social justice idea that, that matters to you? Um, so this is Bianca. This is the quilt Bianca made. And she made this quilt as she was becoming trained in a facilitator. And it's called Activist ABCs. And every letter is associated to a social justice issue that she cares about. And so when kids get stuck, she's like, you know, it's very pop art. You know, she's like, I want to do, you know, like, what should I do for L? And what should I do for this? And so she had ideas and some of their ideas. She was like, she wanted to do S for sex trafficking, but she didn't know what image to do. So she clearly changed S, you know, and T is for Trayvon. She put a fist in his hoodie and added Skittles and asked the embroidery volunteer, can you make this tea look more like an Arizona iced tea? The embroidery that are on these blocks is phenomenal. Bianca could never embroider like this. She wouldn't have the skills nor privilege of time to learn how to embroider. And I think often, well, why don't you teach the kids how to do everything from start to finish? I'm like, at the end of the day, sewing is a really big luxury. And I think that often people realize to be able to make a quilt from scratch costs more than it does to ever buy a quilt, you know, from Walmart or Pottery Barn or someone else who did exploited labor, you know. Um, and so as these kids, they're, they're, they like being the artist. They like having their voices heard. The kids don't necessarily want to become sewists. They're using sewing as the medium because they care about these issues. They enjoy sewing because they enjoy being artivists. So really, they're not necessarily like, if they, if they wanted to, they'd get the lesson. But typically, they po poke themselves, or their stitches are big, and they're like, yeah, I want someone good to do it. Because they want their art to you know, look good. And everyone, regardless of whether you agree or not, like, good embroidery has a certain look. You know, and so they, they, but they appreciate the collaboration. And I think often the embroidery allows them to have things in their blocks that they couldn't do with just fabric, such as write the land of the original people on a 12 inch block. Like you couldn't cut out letters small enough to write that in Spanish. But she asked them to embroider it. These are how you spell it. This is how you do it. The Holocaust block. I want you to add barbed wire over this. I want you to add, like, she wanted the barbed wires, but cut putting that in fabric would have detracted from the whole design. Like, look at this. P is for white privilege, G is for gentrification coming soon sign. She asked for that entire sign to be embroidered. The entire sign got embroidered. To have an adult willing to do, I mean, little things that, you know, a kid asks for is like, wow, like, especially for kids who don't have many adults in their lives listening to them or ever taking direction from them. So I think that's, you know, just highlighting um, school to prison pipeline. Like, look at that, that juxtaposition of kids going to jail, particularly black men going to jail versus, you know, getting a diploma and how, you know, that, that school to prison systemic pipeline is, you know, a, a real issue. And V is for vote. And often people are like, oh, what do the circles mean? I'm like, yeah, the circles, you know, maybe should have been embroidered in white, but you can see them if you see it in person. But like people of color, students, and poor are circles, and this, the box to enter the vote is a square. So they just don't fit. And so the whole artist statement, and she wrote an artist statement for all 27 blocks. Reading her artist statements is like low-key a mini little anthology, because she wrote lots of, you know, she didn't do 500 words. Um, but that's okay. Um, and as you can look at the juxtaposition, this entire quote was made by kids in Baltimore. The entire class is given what social justice issue matters to you. Can you see some of the themes? When you have a quote from Chicago next to a quote from Danville, next to a quote from Florida, next to a quote from LA, you can see LA, undocumented students, DACA, immigration. You see Chicago, gun violence, gangs, police brutality. You see Danville, save the whales, save the turtles plastic straws, and, and not that those aren't social justice issues that matter, but the juxtaposition of what kids in Danville care about compared to what kids in Chicago care about when they're given the same prompt shows their proximity to privilege. 
I think that's what a lot of these quilts do, is landscapes and islands is into the proximity of privilege that these kids you know, have. Two examples from a Walnut Creek workshop. Not to say that, I mean, all art is good art and all blocks matter, you know, not all lives, but definitely all blocks matter. But you can see like, it's just a different world. And I think often when we, so, we, when we have all these quilts, particularly if we have like 10 community quilts in a show and they're all from all these different areas, you can often make assumptions on what demographic these workshops come from. Because it's really, you know, an all size fits all. You know, we've done workshops at Yale and we've done workshops at community colleges. We've done workshops in juvenile halls. We've done workshops in men's prisons. And so as you see these quilts come together, and we've done them in LGBTQIA homeless centers. So as you see these quilts come together, it's like, wow, like, I don't know where this came from, but the artist statements are great. What are these kids from? They were in juvenile hall. They have a very different viewpoint on the justice system. They have a very different viewpoint on their faith in adults, like compared to, you know, kids that coming from stable two-parent, you know, socioeconomically privileged communities. Um, in addition to all of that, we also do action projects where when we get money and kids go through our summer program, sometimes they'll be like, you know, I really care about school inequality. They make a mini art quilt on it. They write a research paper that we, they turn into their artist statement talking about school inequality. And then last but not least, we want to give them a thousand dollar seed grant to do something about it. So then we give these kids mini grants. If, if you've ever written a grant, it's a miserable process. And most of the time you get denied. I've done it. I'm not into it. So really, I think, as you say, it's really about breaking barriers. And like often, you know, I had parents who would fund any action project I ever wanted to do. But a lot of these kids don't have that. So if we give kids an action project, we ask for a timeline. Clearly, we, we have them sign a contract. They send receipts. But like we give them $1,000 to just do something. Whether your issue is homelessness, feed, feed the community. Whether it's school inequality. She got a whole bunch of backpacks. She packed all these backpacks, but all this stuff on Amazon, but all this stuff at you know, dollar stores and made all these backpacks for like 60 plus kids, gave them to third graders. And when she gave them to third graders, she gave them her mom's business card and offered everyone two hours of private tutoring. She's in what, eighth grade, ninth grade? Like she's in, going into a ninth grader. A ninth grader can't fix school inequality, but she for sure could tutor third graders. She just needed something to get that third grader community to get to know them. Like you can't walk in, hi third graders, I don't know you, but I'm here. Like you can't, you can't just walk into a space. You've got to ask what the community wants and, and offer it. She didn't force it on it, but a lot of those moms called her back because who turns down free tutoring? But it was really giving the backpack that even got her to know that and form that relationship. And there's lots of, we've done, they've done community gardens where they bought the wood, they bought the dirt, they bought the seeds, they bought the plants. Um, they did that in like people's backyards. They did, they've done feeding homeless. They've done menstrual packs for women that are unsheltered. You know, so they'll do tampons, pads, hygiene, you know, they've done so many. And so there's lots of that, but those are examples of like things that SGSA funds. Um, this is the Remembrance Project. Um, you could definitely read that. I'm going to say my own thing about it. Um, the Social Justice Remembrance Project was started in 2020, and it extends the longstanding community textile artwork of the Social Justice Sewing Academy into an important historical um, movement. With in-person workshops on hold, the COVID pandemic, and growing awareness of the far-reaching harm of systemic racial violence in the United States, the Remembrance Project provides activist art banners for public display. The project is literally just solidarity in the form of a memorial. And the project was started um, Oakland had some of those um, AIDS panels on display. So a lot of the Bay Area kids, they all follow us on Instagram. I made a big group chat. Hey guys, I'm gonna pay for us to go to this Oakland Museum. We can all go see the AIDS quilt. Let's do a lesson. I'll treat you guys to food. Let's go. So like eight, nine kids came out. We all went to see the AIDS quilt. And you know, it wasn't a workshop. They weren't gonna create anything, but we just kind of talked. They saw the AIDS quilt. And this was like the heat of like a few weeks after George Floyd had been killed. And the kids were there and they're like, we need to do our own AIDS quilt. And I'm like, y'all are like in high school. Like, what are y'all gonna make? And they're like, well, let's do our own AIDS quilt, but for like people that are getting killed, for people that are being murdered, for our community, like let's do a, you know, a bigger AIDS quilt. And I'm like, yeah, the AIDS quilt has a full-time staff and like all this stuff. And they're like, well, we can help. And then, the, then they were like, let's not us make this stuff. Let's us give the names. Let's have our community, the people that are bored of the blocks. Let's involve the community in this project. So I was like, so you want to come up with names, have people make blocks and then do what? And they're like, we can make banners or something. So it was just an organic conversation. I was like, all right, if you guys get home, let's work on a Google Doc. Because, you know, I believe in any idea. Let's work on a Google Doc. Tell me the type of names that you want to do. And you know, I'll ask some of the community people and let's, you know, let's see what we can make happen. So then we, we, desi we started designing, you know, like how we we're going to display all these banners and then they couldn't be this small because to read a name on something this small is too you know so then we was like 18 by 22 we came up with all the logistics and basically we asked this woman named Martha who's an amazing volunteer um, can you make one block this size and this will be like the example of like we want a project we give you a name you make just a block you can sew it you can quilt it you can just glue it you send us the block you don't have to embroider it like most embroidery volunteers do you just make the block we'll, we'll tow it into a banner and then we're gonna get it quilted we'll do the rest so we asked Martha she made one and then we shared it and then we really just asked all our embroidery volunteers these kids have come with all these names. Can you please help so this project doesn't fail? And again, the community stepped up because the SGSA community within a much broader 
problematic textile industry is amazing. But um, they, they came up and they started making these banners and it turned into a really phenomenal um, project. Before I go into the project, I want to do one quick interactive activity so we can talk about patterns. Um, I would like everyone in the audience, if you can, um, stand up so we can do like, uh, just, just to show patterns and organization. Um, so I'm going to say people's, or I'm kind of kind of show them, but we're going to show people's names um, and then if you know their name, stay standing. If you don't know the person's name, sit down. And the last person standing up, we're going to ask questions about the people that we've called names. So again, if, if you don't know the name, sit down. And then don't stand back up. Like, you're just out. Um, <laughs> if you know George Floyd, Trayvon Martin, Philando Castile, Eric Garner, Michael Brown, Tamir Rice, Freddie Gray. So let's look around. I think maybe half of us are here. Um, just taking note of who these are. Brianna Taylor, Sandra Bland, Aura Rosser, Megan Hockaday. Okay. Do you notice how we were mostly standing up when it was just men names? Do you notice how as soon as the list changed from men to women, almost everybody sat down? And if you really know these stories, you know they died in the exact same way as men. And I think like when you think about patterns and we think about you know, intersectionality of these people's identities, um, the second list that most people kind of took their seat on on the second and third name was just black Americans who also had their lives stolen in the same way due to racial violence. Um, and I think the only thing that distinguished, you know, obviously the list were gender and or trans women. Um, but I think a quote that kind of sums this up is a quote from Malcolm X. It says, the most disrespected person in America is the black woman. The most unprotected woman person in America is the black woman. The most neglected person in America is a black woman. And this is a quote from Malcolm X like decades and decades and decades ago. And I still think that this activity still really highlights that fact to still be true. Um, when we fail to recognize and acknowledge differences such as color and gender, we fail to recognize patterns. Um, even well-intentioned individuals. I can't tell you how many times I've been to a quilt show and I've had a well-intentioned white woman not only touch my hair, that's not the worst one, but tell me, I don't see color. My grandkids are half black. And like, <laughs> but you don't see color? Like, you're not gonna really understand the identity growing up in America. And it's not my place to do the emotional labor to educate you on the spot. So that's, you know, take it up with you and whoever. But, you know, it, it's really interesting of like, not seeing race as sometimes people like, you know, I, I just see you as a person. And it's like, yeah, well, that's not how I walk in America. And that's not how America treats me. So I think often, you know, even the most well-intentioned quilting people, you know, have said some of the most problematic things. Um, but as you view, and you know, I'll show some examples, but as you view this textile memorial to victims of violence, you'll notice trends and patterns with the victims. Um, something important to know is when you look at the banners, um, and they're all hanging really beautifully. George did a really great job. The banners each have a color. And something important about the color that's on these banners is it mentions like the type, the type of, of, of death there was. So as you can see very slowly, and like Azeel Ford, the dark brown banner closest to me, there's a little blue tag. If there's a blue tag in the corner of the banner, that means they were killed by a person in a position of authority. So that means law enforcement, that could mean mall cop, that could mean security guard. Like it doesn't just mean police, it means someone in a position of authority. If there's like that second light banner, there's like a little green tag in the corner. So like basically every four corner can have a color. You just have to look closely because this photo is taken on iPhone. But um, green means community. That's a lot of Chicago deaths, drive-bys, accidental, people in the community killing each other. Then there's red, which is ro racially motivated. A lot of people that have been killed because of hijabs, killed because of what they were wearing, killed because they were black you know, in a heated argument, which is a little different than community because community can be intentional or unintentional. Racially motivated is like, nah, I'm, I'm targeting you because of X, Y, Z. Um, and then there's also purple, which means domestic violence, which is a huge problem, and or trans, LGBTQIA. The amount of trans people that are killed, and we don't, their stories don't even make the newspaper. It's just, it's been eye-opening in, in just working in this project alone. Um, so as we look at some of these blocks, you can see what they look like pre-banner. Okay, let's go back. Um, this is Robert. Um, Robert was like, you can read the story if you want, um, but basically Robert was a young kid growing up in foster care who was bouncing around from home to home. He was 11 years old and he got brought into a gang. Um, Robert's a unique case in this Remembrance Project because when he was 11 years old, he killed a 13-year-old girl. 
and he killed a 13-year-old girl because his gang gave him a gun and told him to go do it. So he did it, and she died, and then that night, the gang killed him. He was an 11-year-old boy. There's no one in the Remembrance Project that has ever killed anyone, but I think he was a really unique intersection of lots of people failing him. Foster care failed him, his CPS worker failed him, he wasn't in school. I mean, to give an 11-year-old kid a gun and then he gets killed too, like same night, because his gang didn't want him to snitch, he was 11. So, I mean, that is just a, a profound you know, failure on lots of people's parts. And I think what was so interesting is the volunteer, Ann Shoup, is a lawyer in Chicago, and guess who was one of his advocates when he was nine years old? Ann Shoup. She remembers him before he got killed, and she was like, Sarah, you know, it wasn't that bad. You know, he was in a different home then, and I was just like, you know, but she just was like, Sarah, it was a, it was a failed system. And so, yes, the Remembrance Project does not highlight any people that kill people. You, you have to just be killed to be in the project. But he was just a really, I think, unique case because he was 11 years old, and he did get killed by a gang. No, he shouldn't have killed the 13-year-old girl, but also he shouldn't have been in a gang at 11. He should have, you know, like foster system should have been better. His school worker, he wasn't in school. He was emancipated. If you Google Yummy Santafer, his nickname was Yummy because his favorite snack was popcorns. So everyone called him Yummy. And so to get, you know, custom, you know, popcorn fabric and to, to read his story and have the Chicago, you know, flag in the background, the skylight, like the amount of level of learning, care, and tenderness you have to put into these blocks, it's a lot of work, you know. Um, but it's not even about the art project. It's just about highlighting these names because I think often, a lot of people know Yummy as you know the 13 year old or the 11 year old who killed a 13 year old, but he also got killed, and he also was a foster kid, and he also wasn't active in school, and he also like he was let down by so many people, so many systems. You know he definitely slipped through the crack, and so yes, he shouldn't you know have killed anyone, but you know it, it was it was just a system of systemic failures. Um, another one, and all these blocks on all these banners have such good stories. Um, Amiria was 13 when she was shot in the neck while dancing in her living room. She bled to death in front of her mother from a bullet that went through her TV and a Chicago Lives Matter poster in her window. She was among 104 other people shot in Chicago on the weekend of Father's Day 2020. Um, she was a dancer, a basketball player, a sister, a daughter, a friend. She wanted to become a lawyer. Her favorite color was purple. My son's favorite color is purple. We love dancing in our living room. My husband is a lawyer. My nephews play basketball. Our families are both from Chicago. Her family thinks of others in the time of their grief. That's where we start to differ. Amir Jones, say her name. The background of, the, of her quilt is her fa favorite color. The same color on her casket. Her hands are pictured at the top in the sign of love. She's depicted as a dancer in the middle. She is lying on top of 104 individually cut pieces of fabric to represent the other victims of gun violence that weekend in Chicago. The squares are intertwined and one could not be moved without moving the others. Their edges are left raw and unsecure like the victims and their families. They will continue to fray over time. Their shape is imprecise to depict the chaos left in the wake of gun violence. Amiria Jones, say her name. That's one block. We've got so many banners we could fill up football rooms with like, or football fields with these banners. Like, and I think what's interesting is if you Google her, it'll be like, you know, 13-year-old girl killed in Chicago. None of the articles will say all this. this th we know this because of research. We know this because of GoFundMe. We know this because of searching her name on Instagram and finding hashtags of her family who've shared her photos and her stories. I think often when we think of people who've been killed, you know, media only focuses on like their final moments. And I think this, the Remembrance Project is focusing on who they are, what they liked. We all know George Floyd, but who knows the names of his kids? Who knows his favorite color? What were the hobbies he liked to do on the weekend? We know nothing other than how he was killed. And I think, you know, the book, Stitching Stolen Lives, all these people were writing their book and their chapter and their book got ended shortly due to something. You know, like they, they, no one ever wants to be a martyr. And I think often Trayvon Martin or you know, some of these larger names that have created movements behind them, they're like, oh, you know, he had to die. To, no, like no family wanted that. And so I think really the, the purpose of this project is to, to really show, fo focus and showcase their humanity and who they were. So as you look at those banners that are all hanging out, it would be too much text to ever print them all out, but a lot of them are in the book um, and on Instagram. Everything's on Instagram. If you look at Instagram, you can read about every person's block. Isaiah Lewis running naked and unarmed one month of his um, graduation. He you know, had um, disabilities, and, but my thing is, if you see someone as naked, guess what? You can also see they're unarmed. Why did police kill Isaiah Lewis? I think one of the saddest things when we first started this project, you know, we, we had shared the project, Isaiah Lewis's mom sent us clothes um, because, as I'll talk about later, we also make quilts. The clothes that she sent was his favorite t-shirt and the graduation gown he never got to walk in. When I sent that to Heather, um, if you know Crimson Tate, Heather pieced his memorial quilt. She's like, Sarah, 
first off, a graduation gown is like tricky because it's synthetic fabric. So I'm gonna have to stabilize this. Can I use interfacing? But in addition to that, it, like to get someone's graduation gown they never got to walk in, and that's what the mom wanted his, his quilt to be. And so I think, you know, Alton Sterling, a bigger guy who was choked out by police for selling CDs. Um, but I mean, there's so many names, so many kids, so many teens, so many dads. And I think often, you know, like out of sight, out of mind, but like not for these families. It, it's, a, it's a really, it's a domino effect. Ola Toyin, you know, houseless looking for community on Twitter, found someone who said they would house her raped and killed by a random person on Twitter because she was seeking housing. Being queer can not often get you kicked out. Like, there's so many stories, and, and it's really just about, you know, finding their stories, you know, and finding who they were, um, and really just not forgetting their names. Um, scrolling through the images of these blocks calls to mind the magnitude of the textile memorials that are, make up, like, the Names Project, the AIDS Memorial Quilt. Like us just say, this project with activist beginnings was born in San Francisco Bay Area by a founder whose own life and personal experiences made him close to the issue. The co-founder of the project um, recently said, it was never intended to be a passive memorial. It was there to illustrate the enormity of the crisis, condemn government inaction, and to confront stigma. I think the Remembrance Project has a very similar mission of like, we're not making these just so they can be seen. Like, it's, it's a heartbreaking project. I mean, yeah, some of the blocks are beautiful, but really the project needs to soon not cease to exist. Like, we're making these blocks so we can remember these names, so we can see the issues, so we can see the patterns. But really, like, this isn't a project that we expect and want to go on forever. Like, hopefully we can phase some of these issues out. Um, these are some more blocks, and as you can see, this entire block, like she was a poet, they embroidered so many words in the back of that block. It is just like, like, like a lot of words. To spend that much time to embroider flowers, Monica Diamond, trans woman killed, no one knows who did it, Oscar Grant killed in the Bay Area, Keaton Notice, they have uh, murdered in Portland, they have a vigil on the day he was killed every month where people just don't forget his name. They light candles, his family comes out every month, that's how they keep his memory alive. Um, John Crawford, Summer Taylor. Summer Taylor was a white ally who was in a 2020 um, BLM protest and a white racist ran through with his pickup truck and killed three people. She was just there supporting a movement. And no one knows Summer Taylor's name. And it's like, I mean, we should know everyone's name, but really, these, like, we've got to do something about it. Um, but just showing kind of the, the range of, of what these are. Um, simply put, you know, harm begets harm. This is evident in many of the stories collected in the sheer mass of this exhibit. By amplifying the names and stolen lives of people lost to violence and equities and calling for justice, the participants of the Remembrance Project aim to mend the fabric torn by these violences. So, um, you know, those are kind of what the raw blocks look like. And again, as you see the banners, they get sewn into a pair of two and put together. Um, but as much as the Remembrance Project really fo focuses on, um, you know, violence begets violence, um, harm, you know, can, can, or, you know, like healing begets healing. Um, and so for this reason, you know, thousands of people have also helped SJSA through a bordering process. And so in addition to not only highlighting the injustice and all the people getting killed, we also wanted to make sure that we're doing something for these families. Because making a banner of this family's name, or their family's loved one, is bringing awareness. But what can we do for the family? Well, we can clearly sew something. So what we've done is we've talked to these families when they reach out. Typically they reach out because they see the banner made, or like someone will share it or send it to the family. Um, and then they will send us their loved one's clothes. And we have made over 100 quilts for families who've gotten their loved ones like, you know, murdered. And it, it will be daughters, it will be husbands, it will be siblings, it will be, you know, like, and they send us jerseys, they send us t-shirts, they send us Hennessy bags, they send us Crown Royal bags, because that's what they loved. Um, and they send us just textiles of who these, you know, young people are. Um, sometimes they'll send us photos as well, like one t-shirt and 10 photos, and I'll just make sure that the volunteer who gets the t-shirt and the photos, and, and we'll clearly type out what was their favorite color. What was their, like, we ask the families, and so when we give this to the volunteer, we're basically giving them all the facts that the family has told us, their favorite, you know, they love the Lakers, and this is, you know, and so then the volunteer gets the clothes and turns it into a full quilt. And as you know, like, a typical quilt can run well upward $1,000. Like, this is a pretty big gift to give someone. Um, and the, when I say the families have appreciated it, I mean, like, it, it's been just, especially, I think, the names that no one really knows. And I think we've made a lot of quilts for families that no one really knows. So to have, you know, the community doing something for someone who they often thought, you know, no one even knew my, like, no one knew my trans daughter. She wasn't a big name. I couldn't even get media for her. We know and we care and here's a custom quilt.
Um, Cameron Lamb, Cameron Lamb, I don't know if you guys are familiar, but Cameron Lamb's story, really quickly, he was in his grandma's garage working on his car. Kansas police were looking for another black man that had done something. They walked into his driveway, shot and killed him in his grandma's garage and said, oops, wrong guy, and then gave the mom a few million dollar settlement. And all she wants is her son back. But I think what was really powerful when she got her quilt, she had his family come to like watch her do the unboxing. And they were all there when they opened the quilt. And that's his Kansas City Chiefs like hoodie. And so she cut up the hoodie. So they only sent us a hoodie and a bunch of photos. And his nickname was Chevy Boy because he loved working on cars. And the two little kids in, in that guy's hand and then sitting at the bottom of the quilt are his sons. Lots of people just cry when they get their quilts. And then they're just stuck crying. And it's like, OK. Um, you know, just, just have that moment. Lots of people have memorials in their house for their loved one. Um, lots of siblings, lots of stories. Um, last few slides, um, getting thirsty. As an individual, um, I really just want to kind of push everyone to really work on developing your critical consciousness. That can be done through reading, that can be done through learning. I think a lot of, when we think about DEIB work and we think about how we can make this industry better, a lot of internal work has to be done so we can you know, create spaces, opportunities, and really provide the atmosphere to really bring in inclusion. Because I think oftentimes inclusion or diversity is seen as bringing people of color into a space, but bringing people of color into a space that doesn't uphold the right principles is often more toxic and harming than not having them there at all. I think that's really something um, when we think about, you know, like as brands, as industries, as, as owners, as, uh, as companies, um, you know, we, we've got to do some internal work. Um, as a brand, I think there's a different level. I think you can have personal courage and you can have institutional courage. The founder, president of Bernina might feel Black Lives Matter, but if Bernina doesn't say it as a brand, that's personal courage versus institutional courage. And I think oftentimes we have companies, I can't even tell you, we've got two, three you know, people that donate every month and they specifically said, we don't ever wanna be publicly acknowledged as the owner I believe in your mission, but my supporters wouldn't really like this, so I don't really wanna, and they're in the Midwest. And it's like, you know, if you, if you don't wanna be you know, put on the website or whatever, you know, that's fine, but, but it's a difference between, again, personal and institutional courage. And by institutional, I really just mean like company. Um, but four steps, you know, you can move to kind of push this needle forward um, is, is like when, with the liberatory consciousness, every individual gets a chance to theorize about issues of equity and social justice, to analyze events and activities from an equity and social justice perspective, and to act in responsive ways to transform institutions and society to accomplish goals of fairness, justice, and equity. Um, I think something that's been really you know, eye-opening is like I've, I've done DEIB talks specifically for orgs that are in the most liberal, liberal cities and working with their board and really their core team. You know, something I politely said is like lack of diversity and representation organization is a microaggression of, in and of itself, especially if the company is based in a liberal city like this one was literally in San Francisco. And I was like, if you're in one of the most diverse cities in the world and all you can find was white people, that says a lot. And you know, they, they really you know, had to sit there and reflect, but it was like, you're in San Francisco to be doing this DEIB culture and not one, it was like maybe only 14 people, but not, that's all you could, I mean, that's all you brought to the table? Like that, that's saying a lot. And I think often there's smaller things that companies don't think of. Like you're gonna give everyone 4th of July off, but not give anyone Juneteenth off. That was just this year alone. Whose history is important? Whose history matters? Like what are, what are you saying? Like my 4th of July doesn't mean anything to you, but this one does. We have to work on my holiday, but you're gonna, like, 4th of July isn't for black people. So, like, little things, there's, and there's, a, like, a, I could go down a list of 100 things that companies, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll put a BLM, you know, thing on their Instagram, but, like, internally, they're not doing the work. And so, um, you know, I, I def definitely just encourage people to, to, you know, really get active, get out there, and, and really, it starts with yourself. And then, if you need to, bring in a council. Like, you can bring in people, in, like, there's so many. I can point you references. I could give you book lists, readings. If anyone's interested in, like, just a reading list, we have a reading list for people who just want to start doing internal work. There's Rachel Cargill. There's Jane Elliott. There's so many experts out in the field that you can really, but, but it's more than just knowing. It's intentionally becoming an anti-racist company or organization. And that takes action steps, which are far more than one training. You've got it. It's not a checklist. It's not a certification. Um, but there's definitely a lot of pushing and learning that you know, I think everyone can do. And I think understanding that it's a continual process. It's not a, I've done one, I'm good, I get my pat on the back, my allyship cookies, I'm good. Like, it's a you've got to continue to do the work. And you've got to continue to surround yourself with people around you that are going to hold you accountable. And I think that's also you know, really important. But don't make that emotional labor, be on a person of color, and not compensate them any time for their time. It's a different story. But with that being said, the sewing world has a lot to come.
like this is Orphil. Orphil supports us, should say, unapologetically, boldly, internally and externally. And we said, hey, we've got these kids are adding more names to our list of who needs to make banners far faster than you know we have volunteers. Could you please share the project so we can just get some volunteers? And basically, they're like, sure. They shared a block of Brianna Taylor, and they were just lit up with the most racist comments ever. And they were like, you know, Sarah, do you want us to respond to them? And I was like, it's cool. My community's got it. So then I DM'd my people, and I was like, why don't you guys go talk to your people? Because this isn't going to be done by me. But really, the sewing industry as a whole upholds and uplifts whiteness to a degree that's a really big problem. Like the sewing world could often, I say just the sewing world, the industry, not necessarily the community you create for yourself, but the industry as a whole is synonymous with whiteness. It's synonymous with privilege and oftentimes synonymous with racism. I couldn't tell you the stories of when we were at, um, in January, the International Quilt Museum. Like, it, it was a nightmare. Like, I didn't, I didn't even go to the exhibit opening. Like, it, it was bad. Like, I wouldn't even bring kids. And I planned, like, that's a big museum. Let's bring kids. It wouldn't have even been a safe space. Like, there's so much work we've all got to do. And just because our pockets, our consumers, our friends, our Instagram feed might be carefully curated, there's still work that needs to be done to the industry. And as a whole, silence is violence. So not doing anything isn't helping doing anything. Like, it's not helping push the needle, you know, in the right direction. So just don't forget there's a heck of a lot of work that needs to be done. These are things you can do. Um, ways to get involved with SGSA, you can definitely tap in. I'm done. <laughs>